Good afternoon. I'm going to call the special meeting agenda of June 21st, 2012 to order. Will you rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please call the roll. Councilmember Francisco? Hotchkiss? Here. House? Here. Murillo? Here. Rouse? Here. White? Here. And Mayor Schneider? Here. And let the record show um, Councilmember Francisco just walked in the door. Uh, is there any public comment for item not on the agenda this afternoon? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public comment period and we move on to our work session mm -hmm. regarding the resource recovery project at Tahigua's Landfill. We heard the what and now we're going to hear the how much, right? So, so Mr. Uh, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. So we're continuing the discussion from last Tuesday. Um, we are going to get into a little bit more of the finances of this project. So that you can see the outline ahead of you or in front of you, we are going to be talking about some key financial concepts and we're not going to get into all the details because we would be here for a long time. We're also going to get into some of the key elements of the Joint Powers Authority. Steve Wiley, our city attorney, will be covering that. And then we'll turn it over to Matt Ford who will talk about some of the key business terms that will ultimately wind up in a contract, the next steps. And then we're also going to follow up um, to questions that were asked on Tuesday, specifically the San Jose model. Um, what what they're doing and why are they shifting to AD and all that stuff. So that's kind of the outline. So uh, in terms of the financial stuff, I just have some introductory comments. I want to just say out front that this is potentially a very, very good project. Uh, it's far better than what we're doing today. The status quo is really, in my opinion, not acceptable. Continuing to bury trash at the rate we are uh, without any other alternatives is not something we should be doing. It's, but it's a very expensive approach to things and to bearing to solid waste management. So this is an opportunity for us to, to provide um, a better solution to how we're uh, handling our trash. At the same time, I want to say that this is a complicated project. I mean, we're talking about um, a project that involves five jurisdictions, and just that alone is um, it makes this project complicated. I think even um, John, Mr. John Dewey, will uh, could express his. Is sometimes frustration with the fact that when you're dealing with five jurisdictions, it just makes it a lot more complicated. Uh, and it's complicated also because we have to consider the environmental benefits of this project relative to other options that may be out there. Um, we also have to look at the financial impacts because, you know, finances always have a major impact in your decisions. It could be environmentally superior, but if the cost outweighs those benefits, you have to know that. And then the site considerations, we're building this on, on Tahiguas. It's not a, a, a very easy place to build these, uh, these facilities. The cost to just to prepare the site is very expensive. So there are some issues associated with that. But again, a very complicated project. And as you know, and I can appreciate, it's a very expensive project. It's going to cost over $70 million under the current MRF 80 proposal to build it. We're talking about $370 million in tipping fees that would be paid over a 20-year period. That's a lot of money. Um, also, the fact that with the AD piece, um, not so much with the, with the MRF piece, but the AD piece, it is existing technology, as we've talked about, but the application to municipal solid waste has not been done for specifically in the United States. Um, so, you know, that's what also adds to the complication. And then just to kind of re remind everybody that um, ultimately, whatever we decide, the, and whatever the financial impacts are, it's going to fall to the ratepayers to, to, to um, bear that burden. So um, the complexity of the project relative to what we've done so far, um, and Matt covered this, Mr. Ford covered this uh, Tuesday, but we've spent a couple of years evaluating what I would consider very different technologies. As you know, we were considering things like plasma arc and other gasification technologies that were really convergent technologies. Um, in 2011, December, we agreed to move forward with an exclusive consideration of one proposal, which is the one where you have before you, the MRF and AD. We took out the gasification piece, which in my opinion has removed a lot of the, some of the complications and potential risks associated with technologies such as gasification. In March, as Matt indicated, we completed our first site visit. This is all part of our due diligence. This was at San Jose, and for us, it was a very eye-opening um, experience. It's just something we, you know, we're glad we did. I uh, wish we had done it a little sooner, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's one that these facilities aren't available everywhere, but we were able to go to San Jose and we did learn a lot. 
And then in April, I, well, we had the financial sort of numbers for a while. Um, I think it was really in April when we really started in earnest our, our analysis at a staff level of the financial aspects of the proposal. And as you can appreciate, these, these proposals are fairly complicated and um, very thick and a lot of pages, a lot of numbers. Um, it, it dwarfs anything that I've seen before in my experience in looking at these kinds of uh, financial models. And for that reason, I guess the point is that, um, you know, as we've been kind of going along, we are, we've been asking a lot of questions and sometimes it feels like I'm sure we're slowing down the process by raising questions that are, that are complicated or tough. But we think it's an important process to at least as we go through this, through this if something comes up or ask the question um, and not feel like we're rushed through the, to, to make a decision because this is, there's a lot of stake, a lot of money involved. So we think it's appropriate to just uh, not go slow but move appropriately and methodically to make sure we're asking all the questions and having those resolved. So understanding the cost of disposal, this is the, the chart that I borrowed from Matt and it, where he was talking about the flow of materials, but I wanted to kind of use this as a way to describe and show what it costs for us to dispose or at least deal with our various materials. And starting at the top, the recyclables, and this is in, a, in an order of sort of cost, recyclables, as you know, that are separated at the curb, we do get money for those. All the agencies enjoy revenues on a net basis. It doesn't mean that there isn't a cost associated with it. As you know, we send the materials, at least in the carts, to Gold Coast. They do charge us a tipping fee for that, but because the value of those commodities that are sold um, out exceed the cost to process, we actually enjoy some net revenues. And for this year, we're getting $276,000 um, from those revenues. We aren't currently getting any monies for those recyclables that are in bins and are sent to the Marburg facility and we'll be working on that sort of as an adjunct to the negotiations we're working on now to do some revenue sharing for those, from those revenues. <clears throat> Our green waste, as Matt indicated, is sent to Tahiguas for to be mulched. Um, I will just just inform that from Mr. Schleich that that $48 a ton now is $45 a ton, so it's dropped slightly, but that's what it's costing us to produce mulch from our green waste. Our food scraps um, cost us $54 a ton. We send that to up north to Santa Maria, to Hangel and Gray to, to produce a compost. That $54 a ton includes transportation. And then lastly is trash. That's the, the, the most expensive piece of all this, $77 a ton, and that's handled, um, of course, at Tahiguas. This is information that was provided to, to us by the county staff. It looks goes all the way back to 92 and gives you a history of the tipping fees. And you can see back in 92, they were $45 a ton, and they, there were some ups and downs. Um, for next year, starting July 1, the tipping fee will be $77 and a quarter per ton. Uh, based on their projections, they, they, they expect that by 2015 that those tipping fees will be $89 and a quarter per ton. And since 1992, the average overall increases have been less than 3%, which is good news. Um, in the last few years and projected forward, is we're expecting it to grow more than 8% per year. And the point here is to show that the cost of disposal is just going to continue to go up, whether it's a Tahiguas or any other site. We're going to continue to pay more money to bury our trash. And that's kind of the financial aspect of it, that you know we're looking for a solution that's going to be less expensive or at least more stable than what we're seeing, uh, we've seen in the last number of years. Just to understand what's included in the tipping fee, there are operating costs included in that. So the part of the tipping fee that's charged by at Tahiguas is to cover just the day-to-day -day operations of that facility. There's also some portion to cover the cost of environmental compliance. That's the, all the, the gas collection systems they have to put in place and, and reporting they have to do at a state level. And then the other two pieces are the closure and post-closure costs. Uh, the tipping fee includes some portion to provide fundings when the when the landfill ultimately will be closed. And I always refer to the analogy of, the, of pensions. You know, we have to accumulate funds on an ongoing basis um, so that when somebody retires, those funds will be available. And, and it's the same concept here. State law requires that um, landfill operations start to accumulate funds while it's in operation so that when it closes, they have the funds available to, to pay for all the closure costs, which is to, per to seal it on a permanent basis but also the costs associated with monitoring the landfill over a 30-year period at a minimum. And there, it's you know stalling monitoring wells and just monitoring. We're doing that with Ealing's Park, that landfill that was closed back in the 60s, and, and Tahiguas will have to continue to do that as well. So 
one of the things I wanted to point out th is that when we're talking about the, the tipping fees that would be um, included within the proposal from Mustang, that it, that does not include the, the, what was being referred to as a site lease fee. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So whatever we see here in terms of the Mustang proposal, we have to remember that the site lease fee is, is designed to cover, at least in concept, the funding of those closure and post-closure costs. So, that, so we would have to add that to whatever the proposal is and what we will ultimately wind up or end up with from um, the contractor. And that works out to be $24 a ton. So the proposed tipping fee um, of the, for the resource recovery park, and this is the dirty MRF plus the anaerobic digestion piece. In the first year, it's um, $63 per ton. Over a 20-year period, the average will be about $66.52. Now, those numbers will, sh will shift slightly because between now and the time the facility is built, um, there will be some CPI adjustments so just even before the facility is constructed. So those will be slightly higher, but still within that ballpark. And again, I mentioned this, the site lease fee of $24 a ton. So really on a combined basis, we're looking at a tipping fee of about $87 per ton in the first year, four or five years from now. So based on what we just saw in fiscal year 2015, based on the projections for the tipping fees at the Higuas, you know, the tipping fees for this project could, could end up being less when it's built than what we would be paying otherwise at the Higuas. So it's, that's kind of a nice. Uh, Can I follow up on that? Sure. So but the 86.99 there is for everything that goes to Tahigua. So That's right correct. now, if we bring our food scraps, if we do, if we brought our food scraps instead to Tahigua, that would be at this rate as well, as opposed to whatever the rate would be that we pay to Engel and Gray, Madam Mayor, which is uh, at 55 something a ton. Yeah, Madam, good good question. I think we're still trying to finalize what that charge would be if we were to bring our source separated food scraps to this project. What would be the tipping fee? We haven't landed on the final number for that, but we're expecting that it would be lower and comparable perhaps to what we're paying. Because the other chart you had also had the green waste at a much lower rate right. than the trash, right. but would be evened out at the 86.99 even with the green waste? You know, at this point, we're not, we're not anticipating taking the green waste to this project. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So as I kind of mentioned at the front end, one of, the, one of some of the key features of this project is that unlike our tipping fees at Tahiwis, which are kind of on the rise and there's always that uncertainty, uh, this provides some long-term st term stability for at least a portion of the disposal cost because we're only cover we're talking about 60% diversion of the materials, so not all of it, but at least for that portion, we're going to be able to see a more stability for that. We're also going to be able to reduce our exposure by, by 62%, the level of diversion, um, to all those unknown liabilities associated with burying trash. Again, we go back to the Ealings Park example, you're burying trash, you just never know what you're going to be dealing with 20, 30, or 40 years from now. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, describe and you know, not so much introduce, but indicate who Mustang Power is. Uh, it's Mr. John Dewey who's here in the room. You've heard from him. He's the principal of Mustang Power Ventures um, LLC. And his role really is, he's really assembling as a developer all the independent players that are going to go into this project. He has um, one of his contractors or subcontractors is Bolograph. They're going to be providing the equipment for the Dirty Murph and involved in the construction of that. Beacon Energy Technologies, they are the vendor of the anaerobic digestion piece. Diani Building Corporation, they're the general contractor that's going to be the part of the this construction of this project. They also have an investment banker as part of their partners or their, their project along with a project engineer. And as we talked about, we still haven't identified a, who the operator will be. But those are, you know, a lot of players involved. And, and for, um, for Mustang Power Ventures, this is an investment opportunity, investment venture, um, and it's related investors. They're, they're, Mr. Dewey is primarily been involved in real estate developments and along in some big projects and has a lot of experience. So his, his background is really in the re real estate development and not as so much in waste management, but he's bringing in all the expertise into one project in order to make this happen. But his, their interest, of course, is going to be it's an investment opportunity. So they'll be looking for an investment return on this project. The business structure. Um, Mustang will be securing the financing, and there, it's going to be a combination of two pieces. There's going to be private investment of about 40% of the total cost, as well as some California state bond financing that's available at 60% at of the project. The contractors will design and build the facilities. Mustang will own the facilities, 
and it will be operated by a subcontractor. Ownership initially for the 20-year term will be uh, with Mustang, but eventually it will be transferred to, this, to the county uh, and the partners for $1. And this is what's been referred to as DBOOT, which is designed, build, own, operate, and then transfer after 20 years ownership to the, to the jurisdictions. And the rationale for that business structure is, um, you know, particularly when we're talking about gasification in this project, the, the, the jurisdictions felt that there was a potentially some risk associated with this kind of a project, so they wanted to make sure that the risk was really shifted to the, to the contractor. So it made sense for them to, do, to build it and own it and secure financing. And also that we wouldn't be having to issue our own debt and potentially be, you know, left with this, paying off a debt where a project maybe has failed. So I think the whole idea was shift the risk to the contractor away from the, from the jurisdictions, and that was kind of the rationale for that business structure. Uh, but as part of that, we all know that um, the tipping fees will have to pro provide a return on investment to the investors for this project. So that's one of the trade-offs. It's, it's going to be a private developer, so there's going to now going to be basically a, a profit uh, a component that we have to provide that otherwise we wouldn't if we were doing it ourselves. Yeah, Mr. Smart, so to get be clear on that, so the, you're not really talking about trying to amortize the capital cost, but you're just providing enough profit to make it feasible. Is that right? Yeah, and we're talking really? about this, but yeah, okay. we ultimately we're going to have to include in the in this project in the tipping fee essentially that we're paying a portion of that represents profit to the to the the, the contractor to provide them an appropriate return on their investment in this project because they're putting in 40 percent capital on this project, uh, the other 60 percent from debt. So that's money they're putting in. It's like any investment. They're, they're looking for a return on that investment. So here are the numbers, and I'm, you know there are a lot of numbers, a lot of details, but I was hoping to just kind of summarize this so you can kind of get a sense of how the how the flow funds are going to work. So the top section represents what I, what I would describe as the funding requirements. These are the monies that we're going to need in, in this project that are ultimately going to be paid in by, through a tipping fee or other sources. So the operating costs, and this is a 20-year total number, so this is not annual cost. This is 20-year horizon. The operating costs will um, require $324 million um, in funds <laughs> to cover those costs. The debt service for the 20-year for the period, including interest, is going to be $80.6 million. And then I'm going to come back to the third line, but that's the return on the investment, $127.5 million is what's going to be needed in order to provide the appropriate profit to the, to the developer and appropriate rate of return on his investment or their investment. The other sources are going to come, or the funding sources are going to come from the sale of recyclables. We talked about that. That's a big number. That's going to generate an estimated $141 million over a 20-year period, so it's not inconsequential. Um, much less than that, but still important, is the sale of electricity. Uh, we talked about that on Tuesday. That there is going to be a sale of that commodity, and they're expecting to generate $22.7 million over a 20-year period. And then there are some carbon credits of, of about $600,000. And then the sale of the soil amendment, that, that's the final end product. Um, it's actually shown as a negative number because it, we might find that you know, there might not be a market for that. And I think the vendor is saying, you know, we're not sure. We may have to sort of you know, find a place for that, and it may cost us. So they're building in a little bit of a factor in there to say in case that they have to pay to have that um, disposed of. Mr. Samario, those numbers, the sale of recyclables, electricity, et cetera, that's, what are we basing that on? Is this, I mean, that's a guess, right? That, that's the, those are the numbers from the proposal that we currently have from, the, from, from Mustang Power. So those are his numbers. And as we'll talk about, you know, it's going to be our job to sort of vet those out and see do, are, do they make sense, are they reasonable. But those are based on their, their expertise and knowledge and what they expect to generate in, a, in this project. Okay, thank you. So when you think about, okay, we need $532 million in total in funding requirements, we're going to be able to generate some other outside revenues of 164, and that difference of $367 million that's the portion then that's going to have to come from the jurisdictions. That's the tipping fee, and that's how it's derived. It's really a plug number. You know, he determines um, what's the cost are to 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 run the to operate the facility and to amortize the debt, and what's it going to need to, in terms of return on investment. And he looks at what they're going to generate in terms of sale of commodities. But the bottom line is that whatever difference that is, which is the three hundred sixty-seven million dollars, is the portion that's going to come from tipping fees. And on the, on the right side, you'll kind of see how that works out in terms of, of on a per ton basis, how those individual components compare. 
all the way down to the bottom, you can see that the, t the tipping fees are the 66.52, that's the 20-year average of what we're going to end up paying or expected to pay on this project to generate those monies to provide basically the, the, the coverage to all the operating costs as well as the, the investment return. I'm sorry if I missed this. The debt service, is that's basically the capital cost, the that's, $80 million? No, that's just the, uh, the, the capital costs are going to be funded in part from debt and in part from uh, investment contributions. So 60% is going to come from 16, debt financing that's and 40% is, comes is, from. Okay. is just an investment from the partners. So to be, so I'm understanding the math, the return on the investment, the, that's the profit margin. So we're looking at about a 20% more or less profit margin? Yeah, it's, le it's in the high teens, and we're still kind of trying to figure out what that really comes down to in terms of a percentage, but it's in that kind of ballpark. And we're, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's, that's true, that the return on investment is somewhere between 15 and 19%, and okay. that's really his, his goal is to get somewhere in that range. Okay, thank you. So at the very bottom, uh, you know, we, we kind of talk about the fact that this is a, a good project and that the uh, you know, from a disposal perspective, it's probably better than, than the status quo. But wanted to just to kind of emphasize the importance of us to look at these numbers to make sure that they're reasonable because every dollar in tipping fee represents five and a half million dollars that would have to be paid for by the ratepayers. So, for example, if we left two dollars on the table per ton on a per ton basis instead of 66, we maybe should have been at 64. That's 10 million dollars that we're talking about. So, you know, we're dealing with big numbers, and I, I kind of use the analogy of sort of when you buy a car, the, the, the dealer will, the salesperson will ask you, what, what can you afford? What kind of payment are you looking for? Because they don't want you to focus on the cost. We're talking with big numbers, so anytime you're talking $1 or $2 differential on a tipping fee, you're really talking about a lot of money that, in the end, could either be an impact, a negative impact to the developer or the, to the vendor or a, a windfall, if you will. So just to kind of to explain the reason why we believe it's important that these numbers be looked at and evaluated because, you know, a dollar here and there can make a big difference to the, to the bottom line. So our, our financial due diligence, as I, as I mentioned, we really started in earnest in April. It, it, I see it as sort of including three components. The first is just understanding the financial model. It's very complicated, as I said. So just trying to work our way through it and understand it to make sure we understand what, it, what you know, it makes sense, how it's working, how it's coming together. Understand the assumptions that go into it. Um, so that's item two, is determining the reasonableness of the underlying assumptions. For example, do the cost to build the facilities seem reasonable? There's, that's a big component of this, of this model, and then ultimately what we're going to be paying is what's it going to be cost to build this. And we think it's appropriate to look at that. Are the assumed revenues from the sale of electricity and recyclables, are those reasonable over a 20-year period? And, you know, as I've kind of said before, you know, there is, you know, if I were the developer, I would want to be really conservative on those numbers because if I'm wrong, I, could, I will end up having to eat that. We just want to make sure that, that the assumptions are within a reasonable band so there's equal opportunity that they be over or under rather than be being too low because in the end we'll be paying that for that on the tipping fee. And just generally, are there any areas in there where there may be some profit is built into the numbers that we're not aware of? We want to look for those things. And then the big question, as kind of the mayor indicated, is in the end we're going to want to see what is the rate of return to the, to the, um, to the contractor, to the vendor, and is that a reasonable rate of return? And unfortunately, we don't have anything to kind of compare to. If you were to ask me what would be an appropriate rate of return, for example, for a, a, a hauling franchise contract, I can give you a pretty good sense of that. You know, we know what kind of that is. For this kind of a project, there is no reference to that. And so we're going to have to kind of evaluate that, um, recognizing that this is sort of a, you know, a little more risky than just a hauling contract. So we have to recognize that. But we're going to have to make a decision about First, what is, what is that rate of return, and is it reasonable? Um, and that may not be as easy as, as we think. So kind of where we're at, we have begun that review of the financial model. Uh, we've had a few meetings. The numbers have changed uh, based on those initial meetings a little bit. Uh, so we want to make sure we understand why they've changed. We recently have contracted with the ARI. They're the folks that the consultants that helped us with the whole procurement process. We've asked them to assist us in the review because it's complicated. You know, we, won't, we don't want to take too much time to have it just be done by staff level. It's gonna, it would take a lot longer. So they're going to look at this in more detail so we can focus on the, the higher level kind of disc, um, items. They're also going to look at the San Jose procurement that was recently completed to, just to kind of as a comparison, looking at tipping fees that are, are proposed. 
Um, also look at what they what they're estimated that they would cost to build these facilities to kind of get in a, sen a sense of that, and also to find out what was their return on, on investment that they're that's included in that procurement. And they went through a competitive process. They were they looked at sort of kind of like what we did, and so they we can we can hopefully use that as a good uh, comparison. So for us, it's just um, our goal is to complete this financial due diligence, due diligence by August. It's a you know it's it's complicated. As I said, I, it's I think it's possible, but it's again I don't want to rush this. We want to make sure we're looking at all the details, and um, there's a lot to look at. So, but that's our goal for August. This was obviously a discussion on Tuesday, and I wanted just to kind of um, point out that this whole question of why are we, why do we think it's appropriate, at least for now, to, to study composting, uh, you could, if you wanted to assign responsibility, you can assign it to me because I, it was after the San Jose visit where I started asking some of these questions, and you know I'm not a solid waste expert. I'm just I kind of look at things in you know more financially, of course. Um, and so it just I, when I we had that visit, I started asking some questions, and it raised in my mind. Um, some of these these considerations that were really financial in nature, not environmental or other, otherwise. And what occurred to me was that we are going to be potentially adding a $33 million to the cost of this project for the anaerobic digestion piece. It's going to cost somewhere between $3.6 and $4.7 million every year to operate this facility, this, this second facility, over a 20-year period. You know, it, it, the question perhaps is, will this technology over time, because more become available, like any technology, you tend to see that the price goes down. Will this go down over time? We are currently paying $54 a ton to send our food scraps up to Engel and Gray to be composted. If What would be the price to send the, the, the organic fraction coming out of the dirty MRF to be similarly composted? Is it going to be 54? Is, how does it compare to, to if we add the ATPs? The, it, we're going to also st still need six acres of land on, for the ADPs to screen and cure, as we talked about that on Tuesday, for the digestate coming out of the ADPs. So it's not like there's no space uh, imp implications or impacts. We also mentioned that there are no near-term, at least, air or quality concerns, water quality concerns over compost and an angle and gray. It doesn't mean that in the future that wouldn't happen, but there aren't any immediate concerns over that. So, and then lastly, what I think is important, that the goal of this project is diversion. That was the whole goal. The reason we're looking at these projects is to say we want to maximize diversion, and, and both of these projects would get us to the same level of diversion, roughly 60%. So from my perspective, I just kind of raise the question, if, if we're going to get to the same place of diversion, we have the, the infrastructure in place to compost some of this, this, this material. Why would we add that? In the end, the financial analysis of this might find that, you know what, the, the cost to just go out to England Gray with all things considered may not be that much less when you consider everything. Maybe it's not worth, you know, you know for $10 or $5 on a tipping fee, maybe it's not worth, you know, going that route since the AD does provide all the benefits we've talked about. It's a turnkey solution. There aren't any regulatory risks. But anyway, we it's thought it was a perfect risk to ask those questions since from a financial perspective, it seems like it was a worthwhile thing to ask. So the impacts on the financial due diligence of that question is we have asked Mustang to prepare two alternative proposals. One is to look at the MRF and then anaerobic digestion. So no, an, no anaerobic, no anaerobic digestion, excuse me, no anaerobic digestion, no AD, but having just a MRF, and that should say aerobic composting on site. So if we're going to compost it on site, that's one alternative, or compost it off site, like Engel and Gray, give us two, those two proposals, and we can evaluate the financial impacts of those and see how it compares to just the, if we have the AD piece with it and just to see if there, what's the impact on the tipping fee. That's really the important part. Does it dr dramatically drop the tipping fee from $60 to $5 to $40? Don't know. We want to have that analysis completed. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that as we ask this question, I think it's important to just kind of mention the fact that if we're saying, you know, potentially looking at a dirty MRF only and maybe shipping the materials, organic materials up north, I think it does raise the question, then what's the best place to have the dirty MRF? Is it best to build it at Tahiwas or somewhere else closer to where the materials are going to be sent? It's, it is almost $10 million just to build the dirty MRF, just to prepare the site at Tahiwas. It's a landfill. It's going to cost almost $10 million to get that site ready to build a MRF on that. And as I said, those recovered materials from the dirty MRF are going to ultimately wind up in the LA area. So is it appropriate to have that 
at the heat was or closer to where the materials are going to be collected. So something that this question has, at least in my mind, has raised about the location of the of Dirty Murph, if that's all we were going to build today. Any questions on that before we get on to the, the Joint Powers Authority discussion? Yeah, question. ARI's analysis is just going to be dollars and cents, or are they going to actually consider technologies? And no, it's really dollars and cents, just okay. assisting, with, assisting us with that analysis. Thank you. Bob, um, question about the uh, Santa Maria landfill. It, would that have similar tipping fees to Tahiguas? Not sure. Not sure. When are they? When are they going to be open, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Francisco? I'm. I'm not exactly sure. I can get you that. I was on the phone with the uh, county local enforcement agency this morning, uh, the inspector of that site, and he mentioned that just in the last couple of days, he issued one component of the uh, regulatory process, which is the solid waste facility <laughs> permit for the site. You know, he was estimating there'd be. A couple more years, maybe three more years before it was actually in operation, because uh -huh. if you're aware, you know, the entitlement process is long, and then they actually need to start preparing the site, which can be quite lengthy. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do we put this into um, constant dollars? I mean, you, showed, you went back and showed us the uh, tipping fees since 1992 or something, I think. And uh, they've clearly gone up, but I mean, if they, was that adjusted, or is that just the actual just dollar amount of how much we're paying? Yeah, those are just actual dollar amounts. Okay, and then looking forward here, um, the numbers that we have in front of us um, that you've been showing us, so these are gonna, these are just in today's dollars right now. So they're going to be whatever they turn out to be um, with inflation over some period of time. Sure. Yeah, um, Councilmember House, as I indicated. Um, the first year, the tipping fee is expected to be $63 per ton for this project, not including the site lease fee. Plus the 24 site lease Plus fee. Plus the $24. Right. Um, um, Mr. Dewey has indicated that between now and the time of construction, that that, that first year tipping fee will likely go up by a small amount of CPI between oh, now and then. But it's not going to be much more than maybe $67.5. Um, but then once it starts, there is a CPI provision that every year that tipping fee will go up by a CPI number. And actually, it's a fairly modest number. I think it's a one and a quarter percent range for every year um, that that tipping fee will go up. What's the reference for that? Where's that? I mean, was that the Orange County kind of thing, like they do for rentals and housing? That's really a question of Mr. Dewey in terms of why you use one and a quarter. I, I, to me, I, that was a pretty reasonable CPI factor to use. We, we've used higher factors than that, you know, over a twenty-year period before. So, I, and that's just and. Yeah. Would be one and a quarter. So yeah. Okay, and then um, and then you mentioned the basic strategy is to kind of ensure that the risk is held as much as possible by the contractor, which we can understand why. And and you know they're operating it; they have the benefit, so the benefit and the risk go together. Um, but it's hard for me to imagine any scenario where they would um, they would realize some of that risk that wouldn't be a problem for us. I mean, so um, how do we, uh, the public-private partnership, that's a pretty big bond over a long period of time, and there are factors that are way out of our control in a private enterprise. So how, how do we have, um, how do we participate in that accountability or uh, oversee it or, uh, I mean, how, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little raw from seeing Vista go down um, <laughs> In the overnight, you know, in the two weeks' notice, and not even that, and employers going, you know, scrambling. What I mean, that's a very tiny example, but yeah. Um, and I'm not wishing bad on these guys yeah, at all. I, I just want. <laughs> I think that's a fair question. I think that um, sure. I think ultimately, if this project really crashes and burns, we're all going to be, you know, we're essentially all at risk. But for for the things that we think are are more likely to to occur. Uh, we will. Um, our goal is to ensure that, that the contract provides appropriate um, standards, um, performance standards, as well as liquidated damages when certain performance measures aren't met. So we want to make sure that um, the project is holding up to its, its projection of how much it's going to recover from recyclables and generate revenues and all that. So, um, but I think, in, generally speaking, within the reasonable band of what we expect, that the, most of the risk is on the on the contractor. Um, 
but they have to, you know, they have to meet certain standards that we're going to establish. But ultimately, you're right. If this thing crashes and burns, we're, we're all on the hook for that. Uh, Council Member House, I think that's a really good question because <clears throat> one of the things that's really difficult about this project is understanding the different types of risks involved, who's going to bear those risks, and, and just the nature of those risks. And, and, you know, I think in general terms, and Bob just mentioned it, you mentioned it, uh, there, there's a risk at this point in time, and there will be for, say, uh, the next two years, people are going to be spending money, and there's a risk that ultimately this won't come together for whatever reason. Permitting, it won't get permitted. Some of these permits aren't within our control. Or there's a risk that the environmental concerns will be such that uh, we won't, the, 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 some of the public entities will not want to have a project with those environmental concerns. Uh, you know, for various reasons, there's litigation risk. That's a particular risk at this period of time. Who bears that risk? And, you know, risk, you often hear the word liability. I think it's synonymous with the word risk. And we're going to talk a lot, a lot about shifting liability or protecting ourselves from liability. But the risk is different, and it's different for what period of time? During construction, there's a construction risk, for example. And it has to do, are you going to have the financing and the equity, because it's 4060, to pull this off? If we sign the contracts, are, is it going to be there? And so, for example, you don't ask the financing question at the back end. You ask it early. I want to know that your financing is in place so that you can really build this thing, and I want to know how that financing might impact, as a public entity, might impact us. And that's the construction risk. And you generally, you know, you get a solid answer on that, and you say, all right, we'll move forward because the equity's there, the, the financing there, the, the debt there. The, there's the, the risk with relate to the operator, and we, we mentioned that question. We want to know that this operator for 20 years really knows what they're doing. There's the, uh, the regulatory, what we've called the regulatory risk. And, for example, here I think the, the vendor, Mustang, has been pretty clear that they're not really willing to accept the re regulatory risk. And that's not an un... Uh, uh, it's not a, I don't think that that that's uh, a bad faith position or something unreasonable to ask for. In other words, who bears the risk that the state or the federal government, more likely the state, comes along and says, you know, you're a landfill and you're whatever, you're a resource recovery project, and we're imposing a $2 million a year new regulation on you, and you've got to comply. We're the state and you don't have any choice. Um, who bears that risk? And, and Mustang has said, you know, that's not really, we can't, uh, have that risk in the nature of our project. And so in this case, I think the general consensus, at least at the staff level, is that we can create a, a monetary <clears throat> test there where, well, Mustang might actually bear the regulatory risk, say, below $100,000, but above that it gets passed on to the public entities. And, and that's another point. I, I, and it's, again, this is un, it's not unreasonable for the county to say to us, as partners to the four other public entity partners, this risk has to be shared. The county is not willing to be uh, alone uh, to share the regulatory risk or to, to bear the regulatory risk. Um, the the post-closure cost is another one. It's like, and again, because Mustang, the commitment to Mustang is only 20 years, it, it wouldn't necessarily make sense or be appropriate to say, well, you're, you're going to pay for the post-closure cost because Tahigus is a, a lot about a lot more than this, this project. But that is a risk, and, and again, it's what, what, what do we know about what the state's going to do in 20 years when it comes to landfills, and how will that work? So, again, I just I wanted to mention that's a good question, and we've got to figure out most of that stuff. Okay. Since the questions you brought up are unknowable, in fact, can one uh, bond or insure against those? Uh, well, Typically, for example, like take the construction risk. Uh, in my experience, a tax-exempt financing entity, such as a state agency that might do this, would want to see the construction contract in place and, and know that it's a firm. You know, often these are publicly bid, and so you can't get your financing until you've completed the bidding process. Now, this project would, would be a sole-sourced or, or would be design-build project 
but they would want to know that Mustang's general contractor has the experience and the, and the people and the wherewithal to pull off construction before they'll close that financing. That, that typical is fairly typical. But I don't think there's any tax-exempt financing entity that says, oh, yeah, and, and uh, we'll bear the, the regulatory risk. The, they will say whatever the governmental regulations that come down with respect to this landfill and keeping this resource recovery project open so that it pays its debt service will be somebody's responsibility and it won't be ours. That's, in my experience, that's how it works. Won't be ours, meaning who's saying that? The, us? The, the state. I think it's, what are they called, the California Public Facilities. Um, I can't. It's so. a state agency that I know, for example, they financed uh, in part the Marburg uh, C&D facility a few years ago. It's a conduit agency that you use to issue tax-exempt bonds. So you're saying that we would be on the, on the line for that? Well, we we're saying at this point we want to know what the answer will be. We'll, we'll want to know... We understand that the, the tax-exempt bond issuer will not accept that risk. How will that risk get allocated? Will some of it go to Mustang, will, and then will the rest of it go to the other the, to the five public entities? And that's that's more likely that we'll have to bear that regulatory risk. But you know we're we're bearing we're all bearing a regulatory risk right now with the Hequis, so it's not that different. Okay. Yeah, I just have one more. I, I, I'm trying to put this on to what I already know a little bit, and that is um, we, have, we have enterprise funds in the city of Santa Barbara, and they operate in their, in their own shell, and they have a separate uh, arm's length arrangement with the city general fund. And then, um, and then we have uh, organizations like MTD or the Housing Authority, and they operate in their own realm. We do contribute, participate, engage. We're on their board. Um, so... I mean, how like e either of those kinds of things is this, or is this really a, a, that joint powers kind of thing is so different that I can't really make make um, a, a, an analogy to either of those? Well, I think that's kind of what we're going to talk about the coming next topic. up. Yeah. Well, I was just here to segue for you. That's okay. all. Before yeah, before you, you do that, though, I think um, Mr. Perfect. Rouse. Yeah, uh, back to Mr. Samario. Um, on the slide where you, you mentioned the food scrap uh, tipping fee included transportation does that mean the other tipping fees do not include transportation and the second part of that question would be as we projected out tipping fees into the future uh, having some kind of a curve is that true or not true of the food scraps or do we know at this point in time yeah on the first part I, I brought up that it included transportation because it we're obviously shipping it a long ways you know from it's going from here all the way to Santa Maria so just wanted to point out the fifty four dollars a ton not only was just to process it, but also to transport the materials out there. Um, and then the second part is I really don't have a sense of what that tipping fee is going to look like in the future. Um, you know, we're kind of on an annual year-by-year -year basis with Engel and Gray in terms of what he's charging us. There's no indication it's going to grow up dramatically, um, but just don't know what that's going to look like five or ten years from now. And the second question pertained to what you said about what's the best place for Dirty Murph, and, and Mr. White had brought this up in our last uh, discussion that uh, at, at some point Marburg had one on the table for doing one here in town. And when you talked about a $70 million gross project, and the last thing I heard was AD was like $33 million of that piece. And I don't know if the rest is Dirty Murph or, or how that all works out. And I was thinking in terms of risk, in terms of what the public's going to be looking at, um, and I thought, well, you know, I don't really understand who's got what skin in the game at this point in time, but wouldn't it make sense to to spread that risk? For example, you'd have at some point in time after 20 years, the public's going to own this facility to Higas for the one dollar. And what you're going to own is is a 20 year old a whole bunch of machinery. I mean, the AD thing is pretty pretty basic, kind of low tech. But I would think the MRF has got a lot of moving parts, and I don't know how long some of that stuff lasts. But it'd be one of those things where you'd wonder if wouldn't it be better if somebody else owned that besides besides us, and it wouldn't be nice also to develop something down here where the property taxes would come to the city, just speaking as a city guy, of course. But Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a good question. I, I do want to point out, though, that at the end of 20 years, what's included in the operating costs that are being um, built into these numbers is to make sure that the facility is kept up and maintained so that after 20 years we're not left with something that's really reached its useful life and it's no longer usable. Uh, our expectation is that, or in fact, our, our 
what we're going to require is that after 20 years, it's still, you know, operable, has the latest technology, it's been updated in terms of the types of equipment, and it's going to be an ongoing process over a 20 year period. They're going to be tweaking it, updating it, bringing in new te technology, new equipment as needed, replacing equipment, so that after 20 years, it should be really operable without requiring a lot of money to, to get it um, back up to speed. To follow up on that, oh, go ahead, Mr. Wiley. Well, I was just going to also add, you know, I don't think the, the public uh, staff that's working on this project thinks that we're, we actually will own and operate this thing in year 21. That's not what the goal is. Uh, what this, in theory, and I don't know if this is really how it works out, in theory, 20 years is like a financial tipping point. Mustang says, we can deliver this project and we don't ask for more than a 20 year, we're not asking for more than a 20 year commitment at this point. But what happens with the theory is that in year 18 or 19, we have the leverage to renegotiate the deal. And without this option of owning it for $1, you don't have that leverage. If you give them a 40 year term when they could re get the complete return on their investment in 20, then it's, it, you know, it, you're subject to all kinds of different things. But it, it, the theory is that this would be the leverage to renegotiate an extension, and it's almost like a reset of, of all of the financial assumptions. Okay, so to follow up on that, though, if current status quo means Tahiqua has reached its permitted amount in 10 years, and we're looking to double that to 20. Really, at the end, at the 21st year, Tahiqua is at its permitted capacity, right? So, so we'd be owning pieces of equipment at a place that can no longer accept trash unless we expand the permitted capacity of Tahiqua, uh, or unless we're, our diversion rates are way out, outweigh the, our expectations, and we have an extra few years in terms of reaching that permanent capacity. Isn't that right? Um, Madam Mayor, so, so you're right in that um, this would extend the, the permitted life of Tehiguis. At the end of the 20 years, we'd still have the facility to do the separation, and then there will always be that residual disposal piece, and that's the piece that we'll be finding a new home for. So in year 21, let's just say we've reached our permitted capacity at Tahiguas, mm -hmm. and if we own the facility for a dollar, then we would, or somehow the agencies would then still separate everything out at mm -hmm. Tahiguas, but then ship the residual somewhere Tra else. We don't know where the somewhere else oh. is at, that, at this point. Right. So it might be, you know, it could be another location, could be Santa Maria, could be that in the next 20 years we take advantage of the gasification piece that was, you know, that we opted to defer. And so our, the need or the disposal volume at that point, instead of being, say, 38 percent, might be 5 percent. So I think it's going to be a mix of additional technologies as well as new locations. Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Smarr, you mentioned a $10 million number about site preparation for the MRF. Um, is there an additional amount for the AD, or were those two things combined? Um, Madam Mayor, the, the, I think the site preparation cost, if I'm not mistaken, for the AD piece is somewhere around three to four million dollars. I think it, it was a 13 million plus for both to okay. prepare the site. So the MRF itself, and, and this is so because you're on a landfill and you need to stabilize. And, and I think that was mentioned on Tuesday. Right. Um, you have to stabilize the ground because you're on a landfill. Right. You want to make sure it doesn't sink. Right. All those good things. And so, um, so 13 million for both, divide up roughly between 10 million and three million. Is that, is that right? Okay. That's about right. Okay. Other questions on this item? Okay. Thank you. Please continue. Actually, I, I thought I would sort of backtrack a minute uh, for a minute or two to the, I think it was the third slide about the complexity of this. And it's more of an observation that I've noticed a lot or lately uh, because of the complexity of this and uh, the large nature of this, the five public entities, there's, we, we want to get to the bottom of everything. We want to, whether it's staff or the elected officials that have been involved in discussions, it's like, let's answer these questions now. And it's, it really, we can't do this. I, I mentioned that the other day, you know, SEEK was the biggest thing. It, SEEK was so clear that until you have all of the environmental analysis and all of those concerns and potential solutions, mitigation measures, or findings to override or whatever in front of you, you can't make these decisions. 
And that's this tension that we've got going right now in, in June of 2012. Understandably, the county staff years ago were, were given a charge to basically make this project happen in some form. And they're trying to do what they've been asked to do, make this project happen. And so my perception is they, they want answers. And we'd like to give them answers, but legally, can we do that? There's, number one, there's sequence. Number two, it's just not the nature of this process uh, because the actual contracts will not get authorized and signed by the city of Santa Barbara in about, for about two years. And we don't know what the city council is going to decide two years from now. And we can't assume that. And we can't promise that. And we don't, you know, the seven of you may be here in, in two years or may not. It, to me, it doesn't even really matter whether it's the same seven individuals because the nature of the democratic process is you have, you have the right to change your mind. You have a, from one Tuesday to the next, you know, I listen to my constituents during the week and I've thought about some other things and I, and I feel differently now. And that's, that's entirely appropriate. So we can't promise anybody anything right now. Yet there's this need to get some answers be, in, in large part because some real money is going to get spent in pursuing this project. And I, I, I don't want to bore you, but I, I, it reminds me of the situation we had in the 1980s when the city was, the redevelopment agency was trying to pull off the San Nuevo project, a big public-private project but in, in a lot of ways a lot more straightforward than this. And just because I learned a lot in how you get from point A to point Z with a completed project of that magnitude, well over $100 million, just, just the seven and 800 blocks of State Street. Uh, if you look at the, the mall and what the city was buying up and then what, uh, the, what was then called the Reininga Corporation was building. We, so anyway, we had this beauty contest with potential mall developers. And we had a lot of interest. And Santa Barbara was underserved in terms of department stores. We had a, a, you know, a good, solid downtown, and we wanted to keep. We had a lot of developers, but we had this beauty contest that was all about pretty pictures, all about who was a good you know, mall developer and what majors they could bring. And we ended up with Nordstrom and Carter Holly Hale, which was operating Broadway stores at the time very interested in very high-line uh, department stores we wanted, but no commitments. And this Reiniger Corporation that won the beauty contest was incredibly small. It, they owned one mall in, in Marin County in Corte Madera. And uh, our expert consultants, the lawyer and our uh, real estate economists who had a lot of experience said, well, it's great, Santa Barbara, you, you know, you should feel good about Reiniger, but you need to understand they're too small to sign the contracts with. But you don't even know if they can get the financing. They've told you they, they can get the financing. They promised you they are, and they, they promised you they'll have equity investors. They haven't identified these people. And we were at a point in time, we had already permitted the, the project. We'd gone through planning commission and everything. The city took the, pretty much the burden and the risk of doing that. But we were at a point where we had a lot of money built up in tax increment to buy, start buying the land, and we wanted to start buying up the land. But our experts told us, you've got to flush out the equity investors. You've got to flush out the financing and know that it's guaranteed. And you've got to pin down the majors, Nordstrom and Broadway, and, and have them. And long story short, we did that. It, it turned out Reiniger was way too small to pull this off. And in, within a matter of weeks, they had to bring in one of the biggest mall developers in the country, if not the biggest, and, and they said, we don't need to borrow money. We're going to pay cash to build this place, and we're JMB, and we're going to sign the contracts. And Reiniger gets to sign them too. But, we, you know, my point here is all these things need to come together, and that was actually a much more straightforward project. And now some of, we're asking some of those questions right now, and it, it, it gets, I'll get into the JP in a second, and I perceive a tendency to try to give answers to these questions. And as I say, we really will not be signing anything, and the council will not be approving anything for two years. So one of the reasons for, this, for these closed sessions is our desire to have you give us good, solid direction.
so that we can tell Mustang and the county and the other public entities what our thinking is, what we where we think we'll be in two years, knowing that we're not that in two years that city council may have different views of it, and a lot of this will depend on the answers that will come out of the, the process and to come out of the EIR. So one of the things that's so critical here is that we're going to join with other four other public entities and have some sort of way of working uh, together on this project for 20 years with the county, Goleta, Solvang, Buellton, let's see, who am I forgetting, and, and ourselves. Um, how will that work? Now, years ago, a few years ago, when we had different council members as a subcommittee, uh, when this subject came up, we got pretty clear direction from those council members that the city did not want to be part of another joint powers authority. And frankly, we've had negative experiences with being a member of a joint power authority. Um, I won't go into that, but it has to do with <clears throat> having a diversity of interest, not the same interest as somebody, as some city in North County, or maybe not the same interest as the county. And so we feel there's a need to really understand wh what the city of Santa Barbara's interest may be as opposed to other entities, and how will that relationship work? <clears throat> and the county has, on the other hand, suggested that, that there really needs to be a joint powers authority. Now, let me be clear. Joint powers authority is a new government entity. It, it, it can be a shell entity, and, and in that sense, it can be pretty innocuous, but it's not always a shell entity. It can have staff. It can have, well, for one thing, it, it, it is required to, for example, have an annual budget if it's an actual authority, a separate entity, it's a, it's a legal entity. It can sue and be sued. It can have employees. It can have lawyers. There's a need to have a budget. There's a need to have an audit. There's a need to comply with the Brown Act and the Public Records Act and have regular meetings and, you know, to keep track of all these things. That's for an authority. But a joint powers agreement on the, as a al possible alternative is simply a contract. It doesn't create a new entity. And so one of the questions we raised early on was, why do we need an authority and why can't we do everything we're looking to do with an agreement? And one of the reasons we said this was the county has been real clear, well, we're not looking to create new staff positions. We're not looking to create new expenses. We, this will still be the same county staff administering this. And so that makes sense. And, and, in, and I believe it's true to say the county has pretty much assured us we're looking for a shell entity, just uh, an, a joint powers authority. And the only reason we want that entity is to protect the county from liability. And, and my response, our response has been, what's the nature of the liability you're talking about? What exact, what, and how does having an authority protect the county? Because I'll tell you right now, <clears throat> liability is sort of like matter. You can't destroy it by whacking it really hard or bombarding it with protons. It doesn't go away. It just gets shifted to different, it might get split up. It often does get split up, and then because it's split up, it's more manageable, but it doesn't go away. It gets shifted to other parties, and you do that by contract. So again, you could do all of this by an agreement, because that's a contract. So, and frankly, I, I still to this day do not understand the county's rationale about we have to protect the county from liability, and that's why we need an authority. On the other hand, if it is true that this would just be a shell entity and there wouldn't be additional expense created by it, I, I, it's sort of innocuous, and, and, and I, from a legal standpoint, I don't know that we would care. But it, it does actually honestly shift because I've heard in the draft JPA that I've seen has a budget, has the members contributing to that budget. I'm thinking, why is that? Why do we need to do that? Now, remember, if, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, the county's already compensated through tipping fees. It, this is all about the ratepayers paying tipping fees. Even the, the tipping fee includes the overhead factor to the county, which is, I understand, we have our own overhead factor and perfectly appropriate. Why, do, why is there more compensation? Why would there be more compensation just because we created an authority? And so 
it's, at this point, that's just a question, and, and I think we'll pursue that. And we won't necessarily accept, for example, that you'll have legal expenses and staffing expenses when the ratepayers are already paying the county a tipping fee that's supposed to cover this sort of thing. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just um, acknowledging that county staff is here and I'm sure going to want to answer uh, some of those questions as well as many others. My suggestion would be to let us go through the full presentation and then give you as much time as you need to address that and other questions. So um, just a suggestion instead of bringing you up at this point because obviously there were some questions posed to you. Okay. So, and, and yeah, I, I think there have been good answers, but we haven't always got the same answers, or the documents sometimes don't reflect those answers. And again, at this point, we're not trying to absolutely pin this down. We're just saying, ultimately, when we have a JPA that you want us to submit to the city council and recommend approval, we want to deal with this issue. We want to deal with how the administration works. And you know, another thing, and this is more uh, your issue than it is a legal issue, are how will the voting rights of this JPA work? Now, the, the general suggestion at this point is that there will be weighted voting rights, and it will be weighted by the uh, tonnage uh, percentage uh, that each entity contributes to the facility. So, And, of course, we're a fairly major player in that aspect. So in that sense, our vote would be weighted fairly highly. At the same time, the, the draft JPA says yet, but of the five member, uh, five, uh, yeah, board members on this JPA, this authority, you'd always have to have three votes to, to pass any measure. So my question is, what good does it really take, have to add this weighted test if it still takes three out of the five? And as I say, uh, this isn't for me to figure out. And, and, you, you probably would have a better feel for the city's interest as opposed to someone else's interest. I, again, I, and, I, and I think there's, it's easy to lose sight of the fact, and, and uh, Councilmember House mentioned this, this is an enterprise fund. <clears throat> uh, and I know the last uh, Tuesday, for example, someone mentioned property taxes. Uh, unlike the Paseo Nuevo project, which was a pure private project, I mean, we were the public entity sponsor making it happen. We bought up the land. We built the two parking structures, two other parking structures that they needed in their pub. But we didn't need to worry about what the Paseo Nuevo shopping center was going to cost because that wasn't our problem. We didn't care what Nordstrom's construction cost was or Broadway's or the mall. It was like, that's the market. JMB and Reinega wouldn't have been doing this if they hadn't crunched the numbers and understood that it worked for them and that they would be paying property taxes and that they would, you know, have to lease this place up and yet make a profit on it because that's the nature. That's capitalism and, you know, it's going to work or not and they figured it would work and it does apparently. Unlike, unlike that project, this is a, right now, a, a governmental function bearing waste. It, it is a, you know, people think of it in terms of a governmental function in which we're inserting a, a private entity that wants to make a profit. So, for example, property taxes. Well, that's great. They're going to pay property taxes. There's no question. It's called the possessory interest tax, and they'll be substantial. But the ratepayers are going to be paying that. The ratepayers are ultimately going to be paying all of this. And that's that's different than a Paseo Nuevo type project. Um, so, you know, I think that has to do with, and as these issues come up, how will the voting rights work? Um, decision if I voted. Yeah, uh, next, I think next slide is probably, yeah, that's it. All right, so uh, the next thing we'd like to get into are some of the key business terms of this project. And as Mr. Wiley said, a lot of these are predicated on CEQA, on the results of CEQA. So we'll talk about what we know and what was contained in the RFP and then what could be up for, uh, for change um, by way of CEQA. You know, the first would be the size and scale of the facility. And, and that will be part of the tonnage commitments that each of the jurisdictions commits to the facility. When we look, when we talk about the RFP that was uh, released, it contemplated tonnage 
from the south coast waste shed of 192,000 tons up to 222,000 tons. Because when we started this, the, the crux of the, of the project was really to sort the material that was in the trash can. Our singular focus what it was the trash can. Since then, in, in speaking with uh, Mr. Dewey and, and Mustang, and as reflected in the notice of preparation in CEQA, we started to talk about what else could this facility do. And so uh, in the notice of preparation, and we, when we drafted the project description for evaluation, it included the sorting of trash, very similar to the RFP. It also talked about uh, this facility sorting the commingled recyclables that we currently ship down to Ventura for processing. And we really started to look at could this project really uh, work as a campus, you know, as a, as a, a clearinghouse. Um, it also looked at uh, separately digesting the source separated food scraps that are not only collected now in the business sector, which is really a juvenile program, collection program in the city, but at maximum build out, could we, because, uh, because of the value of source separated food scraps and the, the um, potential not only for greater biogas, but also to make a composting commodity out of that, um, would it make sense for us to deliver the food scraps to that location instead of to uh, Ingle and Gray where it currently goes? It also looked at uh, committing a portion of the green waste that is uh, currently mulched at the landfill and then given to, um, to various markets. So um, depending on how CEQA uh, turns out, the size and the scale of the facility will be something that will be negotiated with the vendor. Similarly, the materials to be processed. And as, as I said, when we started, it was all focused on trash. Now we're looking at various other um, materials. The tipping fees to be charged. The, the vendor has given us uh, a wide range of tipping fees in relation to just the trash can, you know, just the, the tonnage going across the trash. Um, also, uh, differential pricing, for example, for green waste, for food scraps, for commingled recyclables. We've even contemplated a unified tipping fee that would be a composite of all three of those. So th those are going to be things that we would eventually negotiate. Also, the technologies to be used in, in Mustang's response, as Mr. Samario said, they uh, proposed to use a, a dirty MRF constructed by Van Dyke Baylor as well as a dry fermentation facility designed by Beacon. Under our, under our alternative proposal that we discussed on Tuesday, uh, we may only be asking for the Van Dyke uh, Baylor system on the dirty MRF while we uh, compost separately. The project financing, as Mr. Samario said, is a split of 40% equity and 60% bonding. Um, the tonnage commitments will be another key business term, and that's in the end, after all five jurisdictions, try to make a forecast of what we're going to generate in the next 20 years. We will aggregate those and give those to the vendor and say, please construct a facility comprised of this technology to process these materials in a range of X to Y. You know, it could be 190,000 tons to 220, it could be 175 to 240. It, you know, it's going to be a, a function of the aggregate tonnage commitments. The RFP also contemplated tonnage resets, and we have, in the scenarios that we've been uh, discussing with Mr. Dewey, um, it would allow for a tonnage reset of plus or minus 10 percent at the 10-year mark, and that is really a risk hedging um, benefit to the jurisdictions that we'll try to make our best best guess at what we're going to generate over the next 20 years. But if we're wrong, if there are changes in packaging, changes in behavior, changes in regulation, economic recession or economic bust that we, or, you know, boom, sorry, that we know has a um, effect on, on trash generation, we'll have the ability to, to reset the tonnages by 10 percent up or down. Uh, we'll also be negotiating performance standards, and that would be uh, what will be the diversion rates, for example, from each piece of equipment from the MRF, from the uh, anaerobic digester, from the composting side, um, and, and how will we determine compliance with those? And the final uh, primary point has to do with revenue sharing, in that um, in Mr. Dewey's responses, he has, uh, he has offered to share revenue with the jurisdictions, for example, if there are unforeseen windfalls in commingled recycling, or if there is a, uh, 
an increase in, in trash and delivery of materials above what we contemplated in our tonnage commitments where the facility can still handle it. So if he's taking in more waste and generating uh, more tipping fees than what he had uh, forecast, then, then we would make provision through the, the contract with the vendor through the JPA arrangement to share that revenue amongst the jurisdictions. So this will occur after CEQA. You know, we'll, we'll complete CEQA. We'll have a much better idea of the specific terms, even the location of the facilities, and then we'll sit down um, with, with council approval and negotiate uh, these points. Now, Mr. Ford, that's, this, this is going to be really interesting to see how we're going to do this because we have a very strong commitment and a larger scope, not just locally, but to reducing um, at source as well as at the, at the consumer level and even then, of course, with the efforts that we're talking about here today. And yet it seems like there's going to be a really strange tension between, um, between our efforts to reduce the waste in the stream at all and, um, and, and this need somehow to feed the beast up in Tahegas. And I'm really interested to know how we're going to do that. I mean, it seems almost like in the RFP there's going to have to be some sort of an understanding that while we're still taking things there, we're doing everything we can to reduce what we take there, but we have an obligation to meet. How do you, I mean, you're, you're kind of the point guy in this. How do you see us balancing those, uh, those needs? Because I don't see it going, I don't see us doing something to encourage people to discard more things. Um, and to um, be more wasteful or something. I think we're going to be continue to go the other way. And so, the, and actually, not just Santa Barbara, but I mean, globally, this is the direction of things. So, um, I mean, short of bringing other jurisdictions into the JPA where we could get more there, you know, in that location. But now, then there's a dynamic of we don't want to put more of that residual waste into Higas either. So, mm -hmm. hey, this is this is going to be really an interesting Rubik's cube. Can you help us with it that? It is. No, I'm, you're right on the money. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying that this, this tonnage commitment is going to take a number of discussions, starting with the Sustainability Committee working its way to Council. Um, so we'll be going to a lot of this in detail. I can also tell you that in the end, when it comes time for the City to commit its tonnage, in essence, Council will be establishing a 20-year waste management plan for the City. Um, because we're going to make some assumptions of, for example, the rate incentives at the curbside that will continue for the next two decades beyond the contract that we're currently negotiating with the hauler. Um, we'll also be, uh, because that'll answer what do we think we'll have at the curbside and what, you know, what will be in the trash can. Um, we'll also be looking at other behavior driven um, recycling behaviors. So. For example, you know, rate incentives, uh, new state mandates where the, the city will have pressure to, you know, get to 75% instead of 50. Um, so really, in essence, what we're going to do is probably break it into two pieces. And that's over the next 20 years, what do we think we're going to generate? And we'll look at historical data and we'll look at what, you know, what we've, the most we've ever, you know, generated, what's the least. And from that, what do we think will happen in the next 20 years from a behavior standpoint? So we're going to probably give you a couple of scenarios that have variables, uh, key variables having to do with what rate incentives will the city commit to at the curbside in the next 20 years? Um, how much staffing will environmental services have to go out and encourage you know, people to divert more? Because that's another key piece, especially in the business sector of what we divert. Um, uh, and then we'll look at the broader trends of, you know, if we know what we're going to shift from can to can from a behavioral standpoint, then we'll be looking at some deflationary, you know, coefficient and an inflationary coefficient to say, if we started here and did nothing else other than encourage people to recycle, then tonnages are probably going to go down slightly. They'll either stay flat or they'll go down a little bit. So what kind of banding do we want to put on that line both downward to account for recession, for example, or changes in packaging or changes in, in regulation? And what do we want to increase that, that line by to account for economic boom where we know that has an impact, an upward impact on waste generation? So from that, that will be our band. And we'll, like I said, we'll get into this in more detail. But for example, you know, if we generate, say, 
50,000 tons of franchise material today. We may say that, well, the city then will commit, you know, a minimum of 40,000 and a maximum of 70,000. So the, the trick will be the wider that band, the higher the tipping fee because there's more variability to the vendor. Uh, and then the second policy decision that the council will make is, do we want to take advantage of that tonnage reset? You know, that, that plus or minus 10% at 10 years. And if we do that, uh, it, it protects us from under or overshooting our tonnage commitment, but it costs a couple of dollars more on the, the front end tipping fee. And so, that's a lot. That's a, a loaded explanation to your to your question. Uh, that's why we're going to spend a lot of time with the sustainability committee first, and then several sessions with council on just that. I just want to add that after all that, I think the answer is we have no idea what our waste is going to be in over a twenty year period. We can project all we want, and we're going to be using all the data we have. But it's like, how do you predict twenty years out? Predicting five years of the future, and that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. So as Matt indicated. Well, how we're going to help hedge our bets, if you will, is through the range that we established in this facility, which there's a cost to that, as well as the reset, which is also a cost. But that's really the, going to be a tough job for us. And Here in $70 million. We, person, are, yeah. we are going to be committing over a 20-year period. Now, I will say that, the, you know, if we below, fall below the range that we've sort of established in this facility, there is no punitive impact to that. It just means on a per-ton basis we'd be paying more for that same amount of material. Because, you know, it's, so we'll be paying more. The, we won't see a relief to the rate payers when we fall below. But if we exceed that, we potentially could be paying a premium. Well, Mr. Samara, let me just ask this. this. This is the question I would, I don't, none of us have an answer for right now. But wouldn't it be cool if we could design a system with the, with this, whatever structure it is, that actually was by its very nature an incentive for more efficient use of those resources or not using them at all. And, and now it almost seems like we've structured ourselves for the opposite of what we really philosophically and as a, as a whole enterprise we've been trying to do. Could there be a form, and I, this is a good question for sustainability to take up, but could there be some form where there could be another way of looking at it? And that would be something like maybe as we reduce other jurisdictions can participate or something so that we're not, tr we're not working against ourselves as we try to reduce the, uh, the waste stream. I want to be mindful of the time. I know there's definitely going to be some comments from um, our audience and you have quite a few slides yet. So unless there's a pressing <coughs> question, I would suggest maybe you finish your presentation and then we can ask general questions and then open it up. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, as we said before, they're going, you know, the, the CEQA process is is one of the critical dividing lines. A lot's going to happen before CEQA and a lot will happen after. So we just want to talk about some of the next steps prior to the commencement of CEQA, which we're anticipating being in uh, August or September of, of this year. So the first one is to define the projects to be studied under CEQA. We talked about that uh, on Tuesday and then Mr. Samara went through it again. You know, staff's recommendation at this point is to study two projects at project level in the EIR. Uh, one being the MRF and the anaerobic digester at Tahiguis, the other being the MRF and traditional composting. Um, we are talking to our local composters about, you know, pricing and things of what, what it would take and their willingness to do that. Uh, when we finish that review, we will be then recommending one of those uh, proposals for alternate study. And we anticipate that occurring in July or August of this year. Uh, one of the critical decisions that Mr. Schleich brought to or emphasized to us this week is the, is the timing of that alternative proposal and that the, the project is contemplated in the RFP, RFP is a 20-year commitment. And so he was asking, rightly so, what's your time horizon for this alternative? If we're going to compost and not build an anaerobic digester, what, what kind of time horizon are you looking at? You know, from staff's perspective, we were considering a 10-year horizon that if in 10 years after project initiation or project completion and commencement of, of operation, um, would, that would be a reasonable time frame for the, the benefits that we think may occur, the, um, the increased availability of licensing and skilled operators and, and decreases in pricing to, to transpire. Uh, so um, it would be something that we'd like you to consider is uh, the 10-year time horizon if that seems reasonable. Uh, the second step, as Mr. Samario said, was to complete the financial review of Mustang's proposal. 
Uh, we're hoping to conclude that by August of this year uh, with support from ARI, the consultant. Uh, and the next uh, item is um, considering a resolution of support for the project that each of the participating jurisdictions has been asked to uh, bring to their councils uh, in, in August of this year. And I'd like to turn it once again over to Mr. Wiley to, to uh, speak a little bit about what the, uh, the resolution entails. Well, again, this is, this is a <clears throat> part of the reasonable desire on the part of the county in particular to get commitments when the law doesn't allow you to make legal commitments. And when your city attorney's saying, you know, when the time comes in two years and the actual contracts are finalized and they've got to go to the city council and you have to have full discretion to look at the environmental document and full discretion even outside the environmental context to decide up or down on those contracts. So, but the county, you know, again, with all the commitment, particularly towards the environmental process, wants to know that we're all on the same page to the extent we can. So this resolution would do the, that. I think we're, we're generally not inclined to um, do anything but uh, re retain the, the city's flexibility, really what we've been talking about, the flexibility to do one project or another, the flexibility to decide that uh, you know, we want to see resets or, or not, things like that. So uh, it will be, and th you know, this, this is not a, an unusual thing to do that uh, you, you kind of get closer and closer, you get the, the political but not the legal support. So uh, this will be coming, at this point we're looking at August of 2012. I think the main thing here is that we, this would be uh, a resolution fairly unique to the city at least from our our recommendation to you that we word it how we want it to be worded in draft form when we submit it to you, and that you feel free to change it to have it read the way you want it to read because it's your expression of support, not ours. And as I say, even if, if you change your views in a, in a few months, then you have a right to change your views. So, so those are the activities that we envision occurring prior to the commencement of uh, CEQA preparation. And then after um, August or further into the summer, we'll really get into the preparation of the CEQA document and circulation of the EIR in earnest. And then because the CEQA process will take, you know, 18 months or two years or so, there are going to be several other concurrent efforts that we're working on. Many we've already talked about developing the the framework of the key terms for the Joint Powers Agreement or Authority. Another big one will be identifying the facility operator. Uh, the, uh, the Mustang proposal, when it originally came in, did not identify who the operator of the site would be. Um, Mustang Renewable Power would uh, be the developer and then would have to bring on a, a, a contract operator to operate the site. One of the, the key lessons that we learned going to, city, to the city of San Jose is that a highly skilled operator is, is critical to the success of the, of the project. That's something that the San Jose staff really emphasized and even in a conversation again yesterday with them said, you know, our operator has decades of experience, combined experience with their personnel, both on the hauling side as well as on the processing side, and they're, quote, constantly tweaking the equipment and the process to, uh, to uh, reach the, uh, minimum result as well as to um, uh, even exceed that. So the, the facility operator is key. We'd like to know who the operator will be. Um, we've expressed that to Mr. Dewey and he has said that really he'd like to get through the sequel process first because that will define the project and it'll be easier for him to uh, put a, uh, a bid proposal out you know, for solicitation once the, the ultimate project is known. Uh, he's also offered to include the participating jurisdictions in that re, um, solicitation process. Uh, the other item that will occur during CEQA is the tonnage commitments that we've already talked about. And then finally is the site lease uh, component. Yeah. The, the mention of the site lease and the JPA prompts me to, to mention uh, something. Um, 
uh, what did we call it, the, you know, a substantial component of the tipping fee on the, for this project would be the payment to the county for the site lease. I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but $24 of the total tipping fee would actually be going to the county for a site lease. And, and the county has good, solid explanations for th that money going to the county. Uh, for example, post-closure costs, the, the ultimate, you know, the, the, as we know from, from Ealings Park or from the former city landfill, they, these things just don't, you know, go away. You've got these, uh, this expense and this regulatory exposure that is going to be yours long term. And at the same time, the county, again, understandably makes the point, while the county may be the nominal governmental entity that the state comes down on and says, this is your responsibility, it, it, it's not going to change the fact that the ratepayers are really, under Bob's pension analogy, the ratepayers have this responsibility, whether it's post-closure. So the county has appropriate uh, vehicles for dealing with the, something like post-closure and what happens after 20 years. That gets funded through these site lease. But uh, the question arises for us, all right, well, if we're paying, you know, our city ratepayers are paying this uh, this site lease payment, what assurance do we have that this money won't in year 19 get diverted elsewhere? And I have to tell you, one of the reasons we asked that question is the state showed us how they can change the rules in the middle of the game. And they can just say, you know, there's a big pot of money there and we're changing the rules. And when you think about how radical that is and how uh, disconcerting it is, it, to me at least, it raises the question and it's not really questioning the county as much as why wouldn't we, as a whether it's a joint powers agreement or joint powers authority, have an understanding that there's a trust fund established, that there's an enterprise fund established, for example, with this post-closure money that, that dictates that it will be used for post-closure costs or for regulatory requirements and nothing else, and even to protect it from the state and, and that the city would have the contractual right because we, we had that as a term of our JPA. So. Sorry, I just need to add that w that's part of what we're going to be doing, getting a better understanding of that. There is a lot that goes into funding these closure and post-closure costs. We as city staff not, have not had a chance to get into the details of that. We want to understand that so that we can look what's the long-term funding plan like you would for a pension again. There's got to be a plan. We want to understand it so that we're, whatever we're paying on top of the, the tipping fee to Mustang or whomever, that it's, we know where it's going. We know how it sort of fits into the overall long-term plan of funding those costs. All right. So I just have a little bit uh, more to go to follow up on a, a question or a couple questions that were raised on Tuesday about the differences between the project contemplated here for the South Coast uh, in comparison to the city of San Jose, because obviously our, our reference facilities and our due diligence has really been focused on that jurisdiction. Uh, so briefly, um, in San Jose, I guess one of the real critical differences is that the hauler is linked to the processor quite, uh, quite strongly, and that the, uh, the hauler has incentives and, and flexibility to collect the material how they like in whatever collection system and prepare it using their own technology so that when they bring it to the processor, it meets the performance standards that are on the hauler. The hauler has delivery specs to the processing facilities. And then the processor has similar uh, performance specs for the output of, of the diversion of the MRF and the organics that go in. The hauler also pays one of three tipping fees for the organics depending upon the incoming contamination load. So whereas with our project, you know, as contemplated, uh, our hauler Marburg would collect materials independently and then the, uh, the Mustang campus would process those materials independently. And as it stands now, there are really no linkages between the hauler and the processor that we saw at the city of San Jose. The, the specific question that came up was, is the city of San Jose a public-private partnership? And the answer is no. Uh, the city uh, put out contracts for both hauling and processing, but all of the infrastructure is privately owned. You know, the, the hauler Allied owns their MRF. The processor uh, Zero Waste to Energy Development Corporation 
owns all of their uh, infrastructure. There's no plan for it to be transferred ever to the city of San Jose. The, the reason why they did that was to incentivize the private firms to want to stay in business and to operate those facilities. And uh, on Tuesday, we got into the size and scale of the anaerobic digester. It's quite large. You know, it was mentioned that phase one is 90,000 tons of organics, but the design capacity at phase three is 270,000 tons. It's gigantic in, compared, you know, in comparison to our 60,000 tons. It's an enormous facility. And one of the reasons for that is that San Jose is actively encouraging the, the processor to get organic waste from the neighboring jurisdictions. They want to be the central hub of organics processing for the S Southern Bay Area. Uh, the city enjoys some revenue from that, I think a dollar a ton for every ton above 90,000 tons, but they really want to maximize organics digestion from the other facilities. Um, it was asked, well, you know, why did San Jose pursue anaerobic digestion? Uh, the key answer is that the city adopted, the city council adopted a green vision policy. It established a 75% diversion goal for the city, and they, you know, as part of that policy, one of them was to integrate anaerobic digestion into their overall organics management program. The, um, the city currently has windrow composting through their, their processor at a facility called VBEST that we, that we visited for green waste. That will continue. They, they want to continue to make agricultural grade commodity compost out of enclosed sort of sausage technology for composting uh, for soiled paper that, that is uh, separated out of the business sector. Soiled paper really doesn't have the affinity for anaerobic digestion. They're also processing organics out of a MRF from multi-unit residential uh, facilities and that would continue generally because the contamination load of, of MUR and apartment buildings is so high. They would then add the anaerobic digestion piece to their existing um, uh, composting uh, program to digest the organics that are coming out of the commercial trash stream, so, so similar to us. So we talked about, you know, one of the, uh, one of the reasons why was the, the city's um, green vision. The second was to integrate it AD into their organics. The third, and a really big issue for the city of San Jose, is odor control. Um, Food waste and, and organic material, it does generate odors. If you've ever put your green material, your grass clippings in the trash can and kept the lid on during summer, open it after a few days, it generates odors. Uh, having been a solid waste inspector for 15 years before this, I've I have visited a lot of composting facilities that generate odors. Um, in the city of San Jose's case, they have residences located within 1,000 feet of the anaerobic digestion site and anaerobic digestion has the uh, capability of controlling not just air emissions, but also odors, which are a subset of air emissions. Um, the other tricky thing with uh, odor complaints is that they're highly subjective. There's no legal, you know, everyone's got a different nose and everyone has a different threshold for odor. And so they're highly subjective uh, and that th that's problematic. <clears throat> when we look at other facilities in our area, like the Cold Canyon landfill in San Luis Obispo County, one of the reasons why they're looking at anaerobic digestion is specifically because they have residences built right up to the edge of their landfill and they've had to deal with, with odor complaints. Um, as we talked about on Tuesday, there are technologies to mitigate odors. There's the covered piles that we talked about. There are biofilters. We suck uh, air through those and, and capture those odors but they don't mitigate them to the same certainty and to the same level uh, of certainty as an anaerobic digester. So when we talk about odor control in relation to our, alter our proposed alternative of no AD, um, if we take, for example, the, the facility where we currently take our food scraps, Ingle and Gray in Santa Maria, one of the great things about Ingle and Gray is it's sited on property where the city of Santa Maria's uh, sewer treatment plant is located. So it, you know, it's, it's always a great place to add odor to a place that's already handling sewage sludge. 
the facility has never had a history of odor complaints. It's a very well-managed site. Um, as we said, if odors do arise because we're bringing another 60,000 tons of organics from the MRF to the facility, there are ways and methods to mitigate those odors. It would likely require upgrades to Ingle and Gray's infrastructure, but it is possible to mitigate those odors. And one of the risks um, that, that nobody can really control or that, that plagues landfills and, and waste management facilities often is encroaching development that's approved by the jurisdiction. So uh, Ingle and Gray is located you know, outside of Santa Maria. If uh, additional housing is um, is approved and built up, we could have the same, the same problems, but in this case, it's surrounded by agricultural land, all, I think on all sides, and in, gener in general, the prevailing winds blow to the sewer plant and then over, um, or his site and then over the sewer treatment plant. So we have sort of a masking effect for whatever odors could arise. Um, so in the end, with that, you know, when we wrap up, you know, why San Jose did what they did, really they were looking for diversity in their waste processing infrastructure. You know, they're using two dirty MRFs. They are going to continue their composting operation that they currently have, and then they're going to build in anaerobic digestion as an overall piece with a future plan, according to the staff, of pursuing gasification, similar to what we contemplated for the remaining trash fraction to... to further increase the diversion and, and lessen what it is that they have to, um, to find a home for. So in the end, you know, if we were to compare San Jose to the Mustang project, the San Jose uh, model has a high level of integration between the hauler and the waste processor, whereas our project, the hauler and the processor would continue to work independently of one another. Uh, San Jose is looking at diversified organic processing techniques, and we're really focused on the anaerobic digestion as, as the singular piece. Uh, in San Jose, the green waste is composted to an agricultural commodity, and in our case, we, we mulch it now and we move it um, and give it away for, for mulching applications. But if there is, I would like to note that if there is additional capacity in the anaerobic digester, we could digest that green waste and generate biogas off of it. And in terms of size and scale, <clears throat> at build-out, because San Jose wants to attract organics, they're looking at, at uh, phase three of processing 270,000 tons of anaerobic dige anaerobically digested organics, and what we're contemplating is about 60,000 tons, so um, a different scale there. Okay, before our brains turn to waste completely, um, yeah. any other questions from council? Okay, I'd like to turn it over to the public. Um, I want to give the county and Mustang the time they need to respond to anything. Um, others who would like to speak, I just ask just to be cognizant of the time in two to three minutes would be fine. Um, I guess, Mr. Dewey, are you ready to speak? Mr. Lunsford, did you want to speak as well? Sure, why don't you come up first and... And then if you could come over here to the mic. Is anyone else wanting to speak, public comment, just so we... Okay, Mr. Lunsford. Madam Mayor, I'm yes, hoping Mr. that House. maybe when uh, the county has a chance to uh, talk, uh, they, they will at least uh, address that issue of the, um, the the trust fund possibility or whatever that might be, because sure. um, I certainly we, all of us are very sensitive to that kind of issue right now. Okay. Mr. Lunsford. Well, um, I think at this stage I'm pleased to see that uh, the city uh, staff has looked at this as a way to, this project as a way to take a real fundamental look at the waste management system and to try to design something that's compatible with the ideologies of Santa Barbara and, uh, and uh, facilities here. Uh, one thing, uh, a question that comes up is why not do curbside uh, food waste collection. So, and if we did that, would we need the MRF? Uh, that's kind of a, a question because if you're diverting it, you don't need to take it out later. Uh, there could be some benefits in that. <clears throat> the tonnage commitment has always bothered me. It seems to me that it is so speculative to do and it straps the city into a contract. There has to be some way to um, 
avoid that. And now, from people I've talked to, this is called a put or pay agreement, right? This is not always part of a program like you're looking at. So I would look carefully at that tonnage equipment uh, requirement to determine if it's really necessary in this project. And the last uh, comment I would have is um, in terms of liability, I'm not sure but what the joint powers authority may, the entities in that may share jointly some liability, and I'd be interested to know if that's true and been looked at. So. Thank you very much. Mr. Dewey? Try not to get too close. Madam Mayor, Council Members, I think it's important to look at this project in the context of the original RFP that was sent out a few years ago. RFP, the result of a number of years of collaboration amongst the different public participants, engaging a consultant, alternative resources, extremely knowledgeable. They've been involved in over 100 procurements nationwide. Uh, other cities and counties have not faced this challenge um, in a vacuum. A lot of the landfills around the country are reaching capacity and closing. The focus of the RFP, they laid out a couple of objectives for this project. Number one, to allow the public participants to control their waste destiny and ideally to control it locally, which also includes controlling costs long term, and then to do it in a sustainable fashion using the best available technology. This project, first and foremost, is an insurance policy for the ratepayers. The alternative of Tahiguas reaching capacity and closing will compel all the participants to export their waste, either to the city of Santa Maria or further south to Ventura County or to Simi Valley Landfill, which I think is owned by Waste Management. So you know what the capacity of Tahiguas is today. It will fill up at the current volume in 2026. So the question we tried to address in our RSP, RFP proposal was, can we provide a facility using best available technology from Europe that would allow you to divert 50 to 60 percent or more of this waste that is being generated so you can extend the life of the landfill and can it be done cost effectively. Europe is 15 to 20 years ahead of the U.S. in dealing with this waste issue. We have been slow to adopt these technologies because there's been a lot of available low-cost landfilling. That is changing rapidly in California because landfills are very challenging to permit. When Los Angeles County faced this challenge with their large landfill, Puente Hills, they started permitting their alternative landfill over 20 years ago. And that Puente Hills landfill closes next year. County of LA has spent over $225 million to put in place an intermodal facility that will take waste by truck, put it on a train, and then ship it to the new Mesquite landfill east of Indio. The cost per ton of that waste by rail facility is over $110 per ton. This type of technology can be delivered in the $60 to $70 per ton range, alternatively exporting to either Santa Maria or to Ventura County or Simi Valley is approaching $100 a ton with today's transportation costs. So when we look at the 20-year cost of this facility, it's a fixed capital expenditure up front. The fixed costs of operation are relatively flat for 20 years. The only reason we have a CPI built into the tip fee is to cover the increase in the variable costs, which is primarily the labor cost. So our one and a quarter percent CPI really relates to two, two and a quarter percent CPI purely related to the labor cost. And that was one of the provisions laid out in the RFP. So everything included in our proposal has been in complete response to the RFP and the changing nature of the potential waste streams. We agree 100 percent that every jurisdiction should focus on reduction, reuse, and recycling. This is the mantra 
It's been in place. CalRecycle has advocated this for a long time. The unfortunate fact is throughout the U.S., we generate twice as much waste per person than they do in Europe and Asia. We are a consumer economy. We agree waste volume will go down over time. We have to build the facility based on your best guess as to what that volume will be. With the ability to include a negative volume reset, we can accommodate the fact that waste volume will go, to, go down over time. But you unfortunately have to build a facility for today's waste volume. And you have capacity that may be unutilized in the future. If you undersize the facility, then you're going to exhaust your capacity sooner at Tehiguas and you're going to be back to exporting and shipping down the road, which is subject to the risk of increasing oil and other transportation costs. A few of the other questions that came up, in terms of di the difference between the San Jose model and this model, San Jose has a different uh, jurisdictional footprint or geographic that allows those privately owned facilities to attract waste streams from other jurisdictions. Here in Santa Barbara, because it's somewhat of an island geographically, we have never anticipated antis uh, bringing in waste from the north or the south. This facility has been right-sized to handle your waste in the county and not attract waste from the outside. You have the unique site of the landfill because still with the best available recycling, recovery, organics diversion, you still will have a residual of 40% that needs to go somewhere. It is best to put that into Higuas locally versus the alternative of putting it on trucks and shipping it to the north or the south. Absolutely, this is a complex transaction, um, structure, project. However, when you look at the various risks, and the RFP, and our, the RFP was 300 pages, well thought out by ARI because they're comfortable with all the different risks of the project. In our response to that, ARI and the sub, subgroup, the task group, asked us to respond to each of the different risks and can we comply with the risk mitigations that are already structured into the RFP. We believe we've done that. For example, the construction cost or construction completion risk. Prior to the time that the cities, the counties, or the JPA would enter into the definitive agreements following CEQA that would be the 20-year waste stream commitment to the project, all the financing will be in place. A fixed price, guaranteed maximum price construction contract will be in price, will be in place, including bonding, such that there is no risk to the project contractor or the ratepayers that the costs go up once you sign that contract. The operator will be in place prior to you signing the definitive agreement. And as Matt said, the operator selection is something that we feel strongly should not proceed with until we know what the project is. Is it a MRF only project? Is it MRF plus anaerobic digestion? We may have a separate operator for the MRF than we do for the anaerobic digestion piece. Those are two separate skill sets. We've identified half a dozen or more very qualified operators that would be interested in operating this project, but they said to us, oh, Santa Barbara, isn't your entitlement process gonna take half a decade to get through? Well, come back and talk to us once you're complete with that. So it's very challenging to get operators interested in a project knowing that this is a very thoughtful process to go through the environmental review. <laughs> Most of the other risk components to the project are really on the front end of this process. The entitlement risk, the political risk, the environmental review risk, all of those risks are mitigated once we complete CEQA, once we complete all of our financial analysis review, and once we go through operator selection and we start our financing process. So I, I agree completely with Mr. Wiley that there are a lot of variables that cannot be precisely quantified at this time. What we do know now is that Tehigus will reach capacity based on our current volume in the next 10 to 12 years. We do know now that if we don't pursue an alternative technology, the alternative of exporting and disposing to the north or the south will most likely be more expensive than this proposed project. 
and will have a lot more risk because you are not able to collar or put a cap on what your long-term disposal costs are. In terms of the reasonableness of assumptions, you know, the, the price of electricity in this project for 20 years actually is set based on a fixed price power purchase agreement that we would sign with Southern California Edison. The price for the electricity, as I mentioned on Tuesday, is set by the, the Energy Commission. In terms of the recyclable revenue, we have 10 years of actual data from your existing contract with Gold Coast and Ventura County. The pricing for each of the individual recycling commodities has been in a very tight band except for the fourth quarter of 2008, the first quarter of 2009, global financial crisis caused these commodities to go through the floor. Our proposal, we are transferring that recyclable revenue risk from the participants onto the project. The recyclable revenue is a small piece of the revenue stream. 75% of the revenue of the project comes from the tip fee, and that absolutely is borne by the rate payer. But when you look at the overall cost of the tip fee for the proposed project plus the site lease, the estimated incremental cost on a monthly basis to the rate payer, and the county can confirm this, is I think less than a 7% increase on their existing monthly, um, monthly waste bill. My very last point in terms of the rate of return that's built into a public-private partnership structure, one of the things that we need to take into account as private investor, developer, owners, operators is the extended duration on the front end of this project. We responded to the initial request for qualifications in 2009. We expect to be complete with the entitlement process in 2014 to commence construction so that the project comes on by 2016. So before we get to our single first ton of waste or tip fee coming into the project, we have close to seven years where the risk is borne almost entirely by the project developer, entitlement, political, environmental review risk. So obviously we have to take that into account when we determine our rate of return, which goes into the tip fee. Our purpose in setting this tip fee has always been, is this more competitive than your status quo alternative? We believe it beats that handily. And I think you'll find in the next 60 days when ARI reviews our project's pricing compared to what they did in San Jose through an open procurement for these same exact components, MRF, plus anaerobic digestion, you'll find our pricing exactly comparable to what those other uh, procurement pricing has revealed. Any questions for Mustang? Thank you. That was a very thorough explanation of things. Any questions for Mr. Dewey? Mr. House. It's sort of, sort of the same question I just uh, put a second ago. This uh, $24 per ton site lease piece, it seems like it's out of the scope, uh, out of your hands, on the other hand, it affects the entire thing. It's almost like the county's getting their piece separate and out from you know, any risk whatsoever. They're kind of like the upfront, take the money and run with it kind of thing. So does that, does that affect you guys in any way, shape, or form? That, um, that, in terms that of $24 site lease is added on to the tip fee that the project charges per ton, and it comes out. It's a straight pass-through. Um, we actually own three former landfills that were closed a number of years ago. We have real estate projects on them. The long-term closure monitoring or reporting cost does not go away, and it is often a lot more than anyone budgets for or expects. I've seen the details of the $24. I know exactly what's in there, and it's a negotiated number with CalRecycle and the Water Board, and it's largely out of the hands of the county. So please don't shoot the messenger. I know I'm saying it for them, but that really their hands are tied in what that is. You guys have found the downside of not having adequate reserves for that at, at Ellings Park. You know, there are always surprises. Groundwater monitoring and mitigation, if there is a long-term exposure, and portions of Tahiguas are unlined. So we're going to be monitoring that facility for 40 to 50 years into the future to ensure that that leachate from the unlined portions does not leak out into the watershed. Any other questions for Mr. Dewey? I, one hopefully brief question. The 
cost of the anaerobic digester facility at $33 million, and I'm hearing $3 million is for site pre- preparation, so a $30 million facility. No? Nine. No, I'm talking about the anaerobic digester. So the the way it was described or the way I understood it is a big big bay and then airtight bay, 16 of them. Um, not a lot of equipment, moving parts, other things. Not you know. So what what is costing thirty million dollars? Why is it that it just seems like a lot of money for something that looks like a big um, structure with some bays in it that some of them are airtight? Two, two part answer. Let's go back to the nine point nine million for site work for the MRF. That actually includes the cost of the building for the MRF. So the actual site work costs for preparing the operations deck and none of this facility will be on the landfill. It's 60 to 80 feet back from the edge of trash. But the actual site work and infrastructure to prepare these, uh, the site for these two facilities, MRF and AD, is actually about $3 million. When you look at the overall cost of the anaerobic digestion, about $33 million, the actual hard cost for the concrete and steel and foundation is about $18 million. The equipment for the engines that clean up the gas and convert it to electricity are about $4 million. So if you're about $22 million, the balance of that would be the million dollars allocable to site works or at 30 or 23, 24 million. The balance of that would be soft costs. There is interest, construction interest. There are other financing components. The entitlement cost and the pre-development and engineering before we break ground on the site is estimated at close to $4 million. We believe a portion of that cost may be borne by the county on the front end for the EIR, but there's still a significant amount. Typically, it's 30 to 35 percent soft costs on top of the hard cost. The last component of that answer you must address is it may sound like a lot of capex, but our TIP fee fully amortizes all of the capex and all the operations and the maintenance costs in our proposal of $63. So when you compare that to the angle and gray cost of $54 for your food waste, of that $54, roughly $15 of that may be the transportation cost to go from the south coast all the way up to the, the north end of the county. So the, the savings of transportation costs to the north or the south one of the, the benefits of having the lowest tip fee. Thank you. That, that got it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Schleich or Ms. Wells or thank you. Madam Mayor, council members, it's always tough following John. He's so well spoken. Uh, Let's see. I think there's a couple issues that uh, were raised that I'd like to address. Um, probably the, f- the first one is, you know, we originally looked at a project that would take all of the waste and, and do something with it other than landfilling it. And actually what we're doing now is a recycle resource recovery park. It's a recycling facility first that's pulling out the recyclables and the dirty MRF, and then it's taking that organic fra- fraction and generating energy and then composting it and providing it as a soil amendment. So the question about put or pay, I think we tried to address that uh, at the staff level and in in future discussions with uh, Mr. Dewey by creating flexibility by having all of the materials go to the same location. So if we saw new programs that would migrate trash from one container to the other, we could adapt to that relatively easily and relatively quickly. Um, The how do we predict trash into the future, I think, uh, no one really knows. Um, the state of California, based on AB 341, has tried to predict that. Um, that's the goal of reducing the trash buried by 75% statewide uh, in the next seven years. Um, and they've come up with play, uh, ways to do that. The project we're proposing, and, and anaerobic composting is part of that solution as well, is what we're proposing. Uh, San Jose, because they're ahead of us, will probably be the model of that. Uh, we will probably be th- the next model of that, as well as Riverside. Um, even with 75% reduction, they believe that if they can hit 75% in seven years, which is an aggressive goal, there's still 20 million tons 
of trash that will be buried in the state of California. It's referred to as other trash. It's a, a lot of trash. Um, that is where the issue and the discussion of gasification is going to come in. I think also it might come into uh, producer responsibility on changing the way they make products. But I think when we get to that point and you look at what that looks like, you're going to say it's going to be extremely difficult to recycle that. It might be better, easier to change the way we produce things. Um, regarding tip fees and, and, and the options, the, the alternative landfills, um, we talked about their tip fee, we've talked about their transpa transportation costs, and we've talked about the site lease. So when you consider our tip fee, it includes that it, the site lease is already in our tip fee. It's just a reallocation of that site lease into the future, and it was going to only be applied to the trash component, not to the other components. That's how we originally envisioned it. So if we chose to go to another landfill, we'd pay their tip fee, we'd pay the cost of transporting that there, and we'd still have the past sins of the existing landfill that we would have to cover. We talked about closure, post-closure. We've done debt, debt servicing of the landfill to build some of the liner parts, uh, components. Uh, there is a significant regulatory requirement associated with not only paying annual fees, but also preparing at, uh, annual reports, and then that's on the monitoring side. If by chance we find something that's wrong, then we have to deal with that as well. Um, so it's an expensive facility. Landfills are expensive facilities to manage and maintain. Uh, we have 30 years of statutory requirement for its maintenance after its closure. Uh, that is driven by law. Uh, we have to put that in a a separate fund that we cannot touch. It's a restricted cash fund at the county. Uh, there are two independently elected officials that certify that I'm meeting that requirement, that being the county auditor controller and the county treasurer. Um, yes, the state can change the law, uh, but I don't think they're going to change it on this particular one. The potential risk might be that 30 years is not enough time to monitor a landfill into the future. Uh, I guarantee you, after 30 years expires and there's a problem in year 31, we're going to be on the hook. Uh, that's one of the hidden costs of landfilling that we that's not necessarily in this equation. Uh, and it also is one of the motivations of this project. This project takes what's going into the ground. It takes all the recyclables out. It takes the organics out. It does what it can to eliminate the impacts that landfills have on the environment. Um, water quality is always challenging. Uh, gas emissions are controlled. The combination of gas uh, controls, gas collection, which we actually generate energy from, um, actually does the best thing for managing groundwater because we're pulling those gases out of the landfill, those VOCs out of the landfill, combusting them in an engine, turning it into to energy, and therefore, they don't have the ability to, to uh, migrate into the, into the groundwater. Um, so that, that is kind of how the, the, the facility works. That's kind of the issue on the tip fee. Um, we talked a little bit about JPA, and I, and I kind of felt like it was only my idea to create a JPA, and maybe it was. Um, what, what we thought about in the JPA is, one, and, and ARI suggested this early, and I think there was some, and that was the consultant that helped us through this process. Uh, they said that you probably want to do that because, you know, you, you get better buying power if you come in with a larger volume of trash or a, a, a uniform, you know, greater volume. And so by aggregating our waste into a single waste stream, having a single contract with a vendor, you get a better pricing because John, as the vendor, has to only negotiate one contract if we could all come together. If he has to negotiate with five and there's different provisions in each one of them, he's got to adjust for that. He's got to manage five contracts. The other part, and we talked about business risk and regulatory risk. So let's say the, the, the regulatory risk was to happen. And it was over that threshold by where we had to do, deal with it. And, and we assume that, yes, it's our responsibility. And I, and I, as the person that, or whoever is going around to all the jurisdictions saying, hey, we have this regulatory risk, are you willing to pay? I go to four out of the five, and the fifth says no. Now I've got to go back to the other four and say, well, it's a little bit more than it was. <laughs> you know? Well, now I'm not interested. So it becomes, it becomes a, a rather logistical nightmare for those that have to 
uh, for decision making bodies to manage it. Um, so the, the thought was if we got elected representation on that to manage the flow, to manage those, those contractual things that need to be managed, whether they're driven by regulation or otherwise, a single voice, a single entity made sense. Um, regarding the costs, we're not going to add staff for this. I think, if anything, it becomes a percentage of my time and other staff time that's already been that's already within the fees we charge. It would be redirected to this, in essence, cost center to to, to manage uh, into the future. So it wouldn't be a new cost. Actually, a lot of the cost is the, is the administrative support that we get with, from county council, the auditor controller's office, and those things. That's you know, and that's added into the overhead. Um, Regarding voting rights, I think what we saw was you needed representation based on the size of your facility, but also the smaller jurisdictions wanted some 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 representation there. So, for anything to occur, and this is how it's proposed now, it would be be based on the majority of the trash and or the majority of the jurisdictions. Santa Barbara City, Santa Barbara County have the majority of the trash, but we don't have a majority of the city. So we'd have to to get one of the other cities to, to vote with us to make any changes into the future. Contrarily, if Solvay and Buellton and the city of Goleta wanted to do something, their volume isn't enough to have a majority of the trash, so they would have to get one of us to, to vote with them. That's what we've proposed. We thought it kind of balances out the, the volume that, that each jurisdiction would bring and also gives fair representation to the smaller jurisdictions so that at least they have a voice in this process. Um, I thought Steve did an outstanding job of discussing the, the transfer provi provision of the contract. Um, that gives our ratepayers leverage in 20 years at the end of the project so that we have an option uh, when we sit down at the table to go for the next 20 years or for whatever happens at the end. Um, in the Where this concept came, again, was from ARI. They saw in some of the contracts that they had negotiated 20 years ago regarding incinerators. Uh, that was actually, were actually bought with public bonds, they thought they bought the facility. Well, the operator told them, no, you haven't, and by the way, your rates are going up. Um, the jurisdictions did not have any leverage in that discussion. Uh, it's created a bit of chaos where everybody's trying to find their own deal. Uh, so now it's coming to the point where jurisdictions are, you know, in the chaos are looking for opportunities. Some are sending it out of the area. Therefore, the operator of the facility is bringing new waste into the area, and it just creates a lot of chaos. So that transfer provision is really a good long-term security uh, provision for us as we go forward. Um, regarding cost effectiveness of this project, I think based on the information Bob presented today, including the site lease, he thought we were, I think, at about $87 a ton. Uh, based on the projection in uh, TIF fees into the future, we might be at $89 in two years. So implementing this project based on those numbers would be a rate reduction for our uh, community. Um, you know, the reason our TIF fee has gone up uh, in the near future um, had to do with one of two things. One, we had not put away a capital reserve uh, for the facility that was recently implemented by the Board of Supervisors, so we're playing a little bit of catch up on that so we can replace the assets that are there. Uh, the other part is the downturn in the volume of trash generated. Uh, our, uh, our operational costs, our salaries have not gone up in four years. I don't think very, we have not seen pay raises for many of our employees over that time frame, uh, but our tip fees are going up. The reason is, is we have all of these fixed costs, but the volume of tonnage that are going into that to spread those fixed costs over has uh, significantly been reduced based on the, the downturn in the economy. Um, the only thing that um, wasn't brought up today, and, and it has to do with a, a meeting that we had, I believe, on June 12th, uh, was a direction that the jurisdictions would fund the uh, CEQA document um, instead of the developer. What we realize and what you've heard is all of the costs of this project ultimately get rolled back to the uh, rate payer. And so uh, putting that cost or identifying that cost and then collecting it over the next couple of years as a as a regional program fee or wh what have you to the rate payers to cover the CEQA cost 
uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, by rolling it back into the project and amortizing it over the 20-year term, we end up paying a significant amount of interest on that expenditure. Um, in reality, whether we were here today with John or not, uh, we have to plan for the future of waste management in our community. Um, we would need to think of something to do, and ultimately that would end up in a environmental impact report, which I'm very excited to move forward on because until we get that information, we really can't do anything. And every day trash comes to the landfill. It's amazing. Um, so there is some urgency to the decision. You know, I, I, Matt did a great job of describing the San Jose uh, comparisons. I think one of the things, because I thought a lot about this, because it's not just San Jose that's looking at these facilities. Uh, it's up and down the state. And there's a bit of uh, regulatory push to do stuff. Uh, it's called AB 32, greenhouse gas reductions. It's called AB 341, 75% diversion. It's called, I forget what the number, but let's get renewable energy to 33% of by the year 2020. So we're all kind of gearing up to do this. This is an effective way to deal with those things, right? Cost effective. So there's the push. I think also when, when we go out and talk to the community, and, and San Jose has the same thing, is there's a di desire from our community to do more with the waste than we're currently doing. They look at landfilling as kind of an outdated, archaic way of managing waste. So we're not only getting pushed regulatorily, we're getting pulled by our communities to do more with the, with the trash that's there. And uh, it, I think that's what you hear in San Jose. I think that's what you hear in, in, in many of the um, – uh, conferences that I've attended and the, and the peers that I've talked to regarding this particular subject. So I don't know if you had any questions for me, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think our brains are full. So, <laughs> But um, I think that's the point of these last two work sessions so that when we have to make a decision in August, we have now this knowledge to digest, and I, uh -huh, pun intended. Oh. So um, any final comments or questions, Mr. Hodgkin? That's right. Uh, yeah, once again, thanks to staff and uh, particularly to Mr. Wiley this time for that discourse on the past. That really was helpful, and at least for me. Anyone else? Ms. Maria. Thank you very much. Um, I've been hearing a lot of risk here, and that will end up with the rate pair. So I'm still absorbing this um, proposal, but that will be something that I take into consideration. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're talking about simplifying the operation with the gasification being out of the equation and um, um, looking at composting, which is not uh, high technology, I don't think. I, I wonder if there's a way to take, with all due respect to Mustang, to take the private entity out of this equation. Um, can the public entities do it? without Mustang, and is that something that would be an alternative in the EIR? I guess that's a question. I'll just um, throw it out there. Um, I guess I would prefer an agreement rather than an authority in the joint powers issue. That sounded really sticky, you know, what you were describing, Mr. Wiley. Um, I think we need options for location of not just the facility, but especially the dirty MRF. Um, if preparing the site at Tahegas is so expensive, where else can we put it where it wouldn't take so much money? I don't maybe it would take more, but if would that be something that we could that we could look at? Um, the EIR should look at well, I guess it's gonna look at the different methods. Um, the timing of choosing the facility operator still see, you're still Mustang is still arguing that it should be after CEQA and you're saying concurrent with the EIR being prepared, so um, I, and and you keep emphasizing that choosing the operator seems very important. You know, we're talking about taking this technology from Europe, but we're not talking about taking from Europe the very basic thing that you were talking about on Tuesday that they have different shoots and that and that they really do sort. Re, re, there's a lot of domestic uh, behavior and sorting in in the residents. You know, people. Uh, setting aside their, you know, their chop, the chopped vegetables or whatever it is, we can get pristine 
um, food scraps if we tried. I have an intimate relationship with my waste barrels of Marburg. <laughs> and so if you give me a yellow, I'm going to put my, my the end of the celery and the carrots and stuff in there for you. So, but we haven't asked people to do that, right? And, and, I, and I respect that people before me uh, figure this is the best that you're offering, you know, to, to, to stop sending, a bit to, so we can stop burying trash at Tahegas. So this is the best that you've come up with. I, I, I respect that. I, you know, I just can't we, it, I, I'd like something a little more simple. <laughs> just ask people, you know, what can you do to stop creating trash? And I think people want to do that. We saw so much support for um, not using single-use plastic bags here in Santa Barbara and the South Coast. Um, and I don't resent you wanting a, a site fee or whatever it's called, site lease fee. I get it. We all create trash, and I depend on Tahegas, and I feel guilty whenever I put stuff in the brown barrel. I'm responsible. We're all responsible. Um, I see that as, as part of it. I mean, I'm jealous. I think some of it goes into your general fund, but, you know. Um, so ultimately, my decision will be what's best for the rate payer and what's best for the quality of our natural environment. Thank you. Any other final comments, Mr. Rouse? Real quickly. <clears throat> um, yeah, this, isn't, this isn't brand new news. This is something that's been on the table for a number of years now, and I, I feel a, a sense of urgency that I, while I, that I respect staff and the due diligence and certainly Mr. Wiley's position, um, I really don't want to equivocate. I think we need to move forward regionally, and I realize there's a lot of different jurisdictions that have to be served. I'm not sure I understand when we express the differences in the jurisdictions. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that at some point in time, how we consider ourselves different. But I think that looking at this again five or six years from now it would be a mistake. I think we need to make a move, and I think we need to do something that involves not only current technology and what's proposed, but the potential to add in those new technologies as uh, I think Mr. Slight pointed out, there's 20 million tons of uh, garbage being buried every year in California. That's clearly not going to be sustainable for 10, 20, 40 years. We need to look at these new technologies. So I'd, I, I, I respect that, you know, yes, we should have different behaviors. We should be better people and whatnot. But we, we've got a reality, and it's hitting us right in the face. So I personally am going to be pushing for some kind of expeditious way of looking at this subject. I think it's a multi-pronged approach, and um, we won't know a lot of the answers until the environmental review process gets underway and we can have those scoping hearings. So that needs to happen as, uh, in concurrence with all the financial questions. And I think that that issue of when this comes back to us in August of being able to say we, we have questions that need to be answered and we still reserve the right to make a final decision, but we still need to move forward to know what those answers are. So that's the balancing act. I think we're trying to figure out um, how it how it all works because you're right. Every day, Tahiguas, there's more trash going in. It just shortens the life cycle of Tahiguas. So um, in terms of moving forward, that's going to be very important. But I, I appreciate very much. We took a lot of time this week talking trash, and and I appreciate um, everyone being here and uh, allowing us the time to really figure out these items. One last question. In August, um, the, the talk about the five jurisdictions paying for the EIR, um, is that a, a budgeted item we'll have to also discuss at that point? Does that come back? I mean, how, because we're going to have to pay whoever's preparing the EIR up front, right? So, and what's the ballpark number that we're talking about? It's a, and is it just, have we figured those up? I guess that those are questions you don't have to answer right now. But it's it's a big chunk of change going to be coming out of our environmental services department right. budget, correct? Yes, and it'll just be, it'll be folded into the tipping fees. It'll be folded into the rates that the ratepayers pay. So into the ne next fiscal year's tipping fee? I'm not sure when. It would, next year, yes. Okay. Cause, okay. All right. So so there's time to work that in. It's not a mid-year adjustment. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much, and I appreciate the extra time. Uh, we're adjourned.
I don't care to go I'm home about eight Just me and my radio Ain't misbehaving Saving all my love for you 